All right, let's get started. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Really excited to have Morten Lensby here from UserChamp, uh, extract practical data from your support conversations. Again, you can follow along on Twitter at hashtag CustConvo. Be down on the bottom of all the slides if you need a reminder of what the hashtag is. If you have any questions, you can reach us on Twitter or you can add them in the paint panel of GoToWebinar. And we'll ask them all at the end uh, as long as we have time, but we'll make sure we get back to you uh, if we don't have time. So make sure you pop in those questions. So my name is Sarah Chambers. I'm head of support here at Kayako. I am frequently on Twitter, so would love to connect with you there. The really quick pitch on Kayako, we basically help you get better at customer service or customer support platform that's been around for 13 years. We are used by 35,000 organizations to deliver great support to millions of customers worldwide. You can find us at kayako.com and sign up for your 30-day free trial. All right, now onto the fun stuff. So we've got Morten Lenz to be here. He's the founder of UserChamp. Uh, Morten was the former online help manager at Google, where he worked for six years before founding Playpen Labs, which was an incubator for tech startups, and more recently, UserChamp. UserChamp is a user insights tool that helps teams get the most from the conversations they have with their customers by extracting practical data from support conversations. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Morton also helps run a weekly newsletter called The Helpfuls, which creates articles about learning from users and building great products. I highly recommend signing up to, as they, they, highlight, they highlight some really great support articles in there. Um, and I actually met Morton uh, through a really great community online called Support Driven. Uh, connects us with all sorts of really great uh, people involved in support and product, so recommend checking that out too, because uh, meeting Morton was awesome. So let's get started. Uh, Morton, I'll send it over to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And we'll just get the screen set up here. Do... There we go. Do you see the presentation? Hello? Yep, yep, all good. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. All right. So let's get into it. So, first of all, thank you. Um, for being here, everyone. Thank you for joining. So today we'll be taking a look at how you get information out of your support conversations and, in particular, how you make it useful to the rest of your company. The first, just a couple of notes on on my background. Uh, I won't bore you with uh, my uh, my life story, but just a couple of notes on stuff that's relevant to what we'll be talking about here. Um, so I've been working on various aspects of customer support from uh, from setting up support teams, account management teams, building self-service platforms, so building out help centers and setting up um, escalation channels like emails, chat phones, etc. And I've done that both in very small startups and in very large companies. My background is primarily in B2B software, um, and that's where I'll draw most of my examples. What I'll be talking about here is in no ways um, specific to B2B or even software, though. So whichever area you're in, um, the general principles here should should apply to your day-to-day -day work. Um, and just one note on terminology before I go any deeper. Um, I talk about support conversations. Um, you can substitute uh, support or support teams for customer happiness, customer success, account management. Basically any team that talks to current customers of your company in any way, um, both in a reactive sense, so answering questions that come in through email or chat, but also uh, in some in some cases proactive. So things like customer success calls where you reach out to help customers get the most out of the product you're selling them. Um, all right, so first let's just take a look at why these support conversations are even interesting to look at in the first place. Um, support conversations are unique in a few different ways compared to other types of data on customers. Um, and 
they're unique, but they're no better or worse than other sources of data. So, so that's to just keep that in mind. Um, but some of the things that characterize support conversations is that, and this may seem obvious, but it's actually a, a, an important characteristic of support conversations, is that people want to talk to the support team. Now, there are some, there are different examples of, or different cases for this, right? Um, it may be the case that they need to talk to you because something is broken or difficult to use. Um, and that, that those aren't necessarily the happiest conversations. I, I like to think that, that we help people out and solve the problems. Um, but even in these cases, um, it's, it's a conversation that helps the customer. Um, and, and other types of, of conversations, um, if we're talking about more sort of consultative help, so helping a customer figure out how to get more value out of the tool that we're selling them. Um, in all these cases, these are conversations that the customer is interested in having, as opposed to some other types of conversations you can most you can maybe imagine. Um, and through these conversations, you have access to a very rich set of information, which is where thinking like a user researcher comes in. So user research is all about understanding an audience. And it's built on um, the ethnographic approach where you go out um, and spend time with a particular group of people to see how they live, what they do, um, and basically study their culture. Now, that, that may be a little extreme for what we're talking about here, but the same principles apply. Um, through the conversations you have with customers, you actually have an opportunity to get a much broader understanding about what's going on in their business, um, what they need the tools you're supplying to do for them, um, what's going on, in some cases, what's going on in their life uh, right now. Um, but, but generally, you have an opportunity to get at the goals and motivations of your users. And that's really my main point in terms of thinking like a user researcher is for you to develop this sort of peripheral vision where um, regardless what sort of interaction you're having with your customers, it may just be a one-two email conversation about something that they need um, help setting up. Um, but even in those conversations, you'll occasionally get nuggets of information um, about what else is going on on their end. So, so just keep that in mind for now. Also, you have a lot of internal information about these customers that you are in a unique position to combine. So you've talked to them. You understand what's going on. You understand part of their motivation. But you also have access to CRM data, maybe, um, information about which features they're using or not using in the product on an ongoing basis. And, and that's a very uh, unique position to be in, to be able to combine all of these things. So that's all great. Um, and we could talk about the, these conversations for, uh, for a long time. But today, we're actually going to start at the other end. We're going to start by looking at where all of this information can be useful in your company and what it takes to make it um, useful. So as we just talked about, the support team sits on a gold mine of information that can help other teams. Um, and now, just one note on, on the blobs here. Depending on the size of your company, you, you may or may not have individual teams for each of these functions. Um, but whether you're in a five or a 5,000 people company, most of the blobs here represent tasks that need to be completed, right? It may be you may have a whole division that works on sales or on marketing or it may be part of what the CEO does, but in your company there are people who can benefit from the insights that you get from having conversations with users. Um, also, there may well be people in your company that I haven't listed here. If you're working in e-commerce, you may have uh, people doing fulfillment, uh, people running a warehouse somewhere that may be very relevant um, to talk to. So, again, the user research approach we're talking about here applies at both ends of these arrows. And what we'll do now is actually go take a look at um, some ways for you to identify 
exactly what your support conversations can do to help these other teams achieve their goals. So in terms of um, figuring out how you can help these other teams, um, it is, it's possible that you already have um, reporting set up internally in your company. You may have updates going out, relationships, one-to-ones with managers of other teams, things like that, or you may have none of that. Um, regardless which level you're at, uh, I'll, I'll encourage you to, as we're going through the next things here, consider how you can go a level deeper in your company. Um, figure out like what's the next what's the next level you can get to with um, helping your colleagues. And before we look at the individual teams here, let's just look at a couple of things that'll help you get a better understanding of what the other teams in your company need. So those of you working in support teams um, are most likely fairly empathetic people already, either by nature or, or at this point, it may be an acquired skill. Um, but this is one thing that is very important to bring to these conversations I'll encourage you to have with the other teams in your company. So back to the user researcher approach, we're actually going to be applying that to uh, talking to the sales team at your company. Um, and since what we're trying to do right now is to figure out how support conversations can help these other teams. And to do that, we need to truly understand the goals and the reality of the other teams in your company. Um, that also means that you need to forget about tickets for a while. Because as we're having these conversations with other teams to truly understand what they're trying to achieve, you need to let go of what you're trying to achieve, at least for a little while. We'll, we'll get back to it, but for now, you're not trying to convince anyone of anything. You're only trying to learn, which means that um, it's a good thing to just do a quick check on our blind spots, especially that one billing bug that really gets you into the red field every time the product team seems to ignore the thing that obviously needs to be fixed. That is not important right now. Um, what's important right now is to have a good conversation with the people you work with. And those conversations start with a, with a simple question. And we'll take a look at those. Um, and just one other note, there are, we're touching on a lot of different topics here. And um, there are many things here that we, we could dive into and, and, and spend hours on. So we're, we're sort of, we're moving through these things fairly briskly, but my hope for what we're going through here is to give you a few very specific things that you can go do today or tomorrow, tomorrow uh, regardless which level you're working at or regardless which company you're in, um, but a, a handful of things that you can go do right away that'll start moving you towards getting more value out of your support conversations. And a good way to start that and to start the conversation with the other teams in your company is to ask them one good question. And this is a good one to start with. This is actually a question that works very well, whether you're talking to your customers, your teammates, or um, your colleagues in other teams in the company. Um, and if you think about it, it's perfect in a couple of different ways. It's uh, you're trying to understand what's most important to your colleagues, and the most important thing is, or the the thing that's top of mind is most often the biggest challenge, right? The thing that, that keeps people awake at night, um, and that's also what people love to talk about. So start with this. You may think of a better way, a version of this question. You may want to get more specific, but you can pretty much walk up to anyone in your company right now, ask them this question, and in five minutes you will have some very valuable information to help figure out um, how you can help them. So 
let's just take a quick look at a couple of teams in a company and talk a little bit about what sort of information um, or what sort of challenges they may have and what sort of information may be helpful to them. So we'll start out with the product team. Um, and as I mentioned before, one thing that's important is to understand both the goals and the reality of the other teams in your company. And product teams, and this is fairly, this is a little simplified, but um, product teams live in a, rea in a reality that's shaped by backlogs and code in many cases. Um, the same way a support team's world is often shaped by tickets or phone calls. And that's just important to keep in mind uh, because that, that sort of frames our understanding of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they also exist in a, in a reality of constant time and resource constraints, right? Which leads to them having to make trade-offs that always result in, well, that often result in someone getting angry um, or at least not getting exactly what they want. And that's a very large part of what, what product teams have to deal with. Um, where support conversations can help. Product teams are obviously are things like identifying bugs that need to be fixed, um, channeling feature requests from customers, and other sort of explicit feedback users have. But the real value comes in understanding the user's context and reality, as we talked about before, um, and bring that richer information, those stories about the everyday challenges of a customer bringing that to the product team um, because that is helpful when they're trying to figure out what to prioritize next. They'll probably be looking at uh, feature usage and things like that, but giving them that richer understanding of what a, f what a feature, not just how a feature is used, but what it actually means to your user is can be very impactful. Um, other teams can also benefit from this. So. Looking at sales and marketing teams here, sales and marketing teams are, they are thirsty for the sort of knowledge that um, support teams have because these are things you can learn from current customers that can be directly applied to what sales and marketing teams are doing. Um, so in the case of sales teams, um, again, let's just look at the reality of a sales team. So. A sales team is characterized by a workday that's driven that's driven by numbers. If we're talking like straight up uh, direct, you know, cold calling sales, there's going to be some sort of quota. Um, it's all going to be focused on short term results, um, and really what needs to be sold this week, what needs to be sold today, what needs to be sold before lunch today. Um, and that's just the reality that a sales team operates in. Um, so often there's a lot of high pressure and a lot of focus on things that need to happen right now, um, which doesn't leave a lot of time to go spend time on researching the sort of uh, information about current customers that could actually help salespeople. Because things that can help the sales team is thing, are things like um, stories about what you, customers truly find valuable once they get up and running with a product, right? If um, there's a particular wow moment uh, two or three months in, that is gold for a sales team because that's the kind of information that can help them, one, identify uh, customers that could benefit from the product, but it's also, um, it's great uh, pitch material. These are great examples for them to, to show and walk through with potential customers. Um, another and one of my favorite examples is to push onboarding material upstream before a customer is actually a customer. Um, especially if your your sales team does what's called challenger sales, where they challenge potential customers on whether they will be able to do what it takes to be successful with the product that you're trying to sell them on. Um, in those cases, showing them examples of what current customers, the effort current customers had to put in to be successful um, fits right into that strategy. Uh, for marketing, there are many other examples. They may be looking for co-marketing partners, so they're interested in what other products customers are using. 
Um, but again, the question, again, to, to get started is really, what is your biggest challenge right now? And, um, and then from there, get into the nitty gritty of how do these teams operate? So finally, let's just take a quick look at what CEOs need. And depending on your, your company size, again, you can replace CEO with um, anyone in a, in a senior position or a strategic position at, at your company. Um, and what's interesting about asking this question to a CEO is that your CEO is sort of the janitor of, of your company. So she needs to, one, she needs to know everything that's going on in all the teams, which means that um, whatever is a challenge for any of the other teams you've talked to will be a concern for the CEO. But the other thing your CEO does is um, make the trains run, right? So your CEO spends a lot of time on how all these uh, pieces fit together. So how does a problem with the sales pipeline impact the product roadmap or vice versa? Um, and how does the user perception of a new feature impact the what the marketing team is doing? Um, so again, starting with the just asking what the biggest challenge is right now will give you some very valuable information fairly quickly. So that was a, a, a quick look at some of the different teams. Um, the important thing is really that you just go find them and ask the question. That's where it all starts. Um, now let's look at some of the information that's at your disposal to start uh, start helping some of these poor people <laughs> with the problems they have. Um, and in, in this section, we're going to be, again, fairly quickly taking a look at some of the types of information that can be extracted from support conversations. Um, again, before we do that, just a couple of things for you to keep in mind. First, um, <laughs> beware of the dashboard, and or as I also like to call it, the give me all the things trap. So this is something to keep in mind, both when you're talking to your colleagues and when you start looking at what information you can provide them with. I call it the dashboard trap, not to hate on dashboards, but because what we're trying to do here is to find something very um, specific that you can, some very specific information you can give to your colleagues that helps them solve a specific problem. And Dashboards, um, I like to, I think of dashboards as a red flag. So if you're having, if you're talking to um, your product team or you're starting to look at the information you have available that you'd like to provide them with, if the solution that comes up is a dashboard, just double check that a dashboard is actually the right solution and not just sort of a cop out from truly identifying one thing that you can help this other team with. Um, and narrowing down the specific information that your colleagues need. So again, not hating on dashboards, but if they come up as the initial solution to someone's problem, then that's probably a red flag. So what I want to challenge you to do when you start thinking about how you can help your colleagues is, um, and when you go talk to them as well, is to find the one top priority. Um, there can be only one, to quote Highlander which is a great 80s movie that you may not all have watched. But there is one, one priority. Um, find that one priority. And then keep the solution small. So the information you're going to be pulling out of, of working with your customers to give to, the, say, the marketing team to help them improve their targeting, make that the smallest thing possible. Um, this is product management philosophy, right? Minimum viable product if you're a lean startup person. Um, but it's really what you are trying to do here is you will, you're going to be iterating on this. So you need to start with the smallest possible thing that will address the, the top problem for a particular team in your company. And then time box it. And don't, um, don't start creating a report and say, oh, we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. Time box it. Say, okay, that's, that's great. So, you need some examples of 
uh, customer's wow moment after three months, that, that's good. I will, oh, I will find that for you every week and send it to you, and I will do that for four weeks. And then we will take a look at how useful that was to you, whether that was in fact integrated in the sales pitch that you guys are doing. So time box it. Okay, so let's dive into the types of information that are available in your, in your help desk. Um, and let's start with things that are easy to count. Um, they, these are also things that are easy to build dashboards for, so, so be a little careful. Um, but most of you probably do some sort of um, reporting on what questions come in. Um, the most common way is to do some sort of tagging. So adding a tag to um, chats, emails, and in some cases um, notes from phone calls as well uh, that, that puts them in a, in a category of questions. Um, and there are a few common approaches to this. Um, and again, if you're not doing any of this or you're sort of doing it, really think about what's the smallest amount of tagging you need to be doing to produce the information your colleagues need to make whichever decision they need to make. Um, so in terms of approaches, um, one, one approach is, is to tag everything, right? So every, um, every member of the support team tags whatever question they answer um, as, they're, as they're answering them. Um, what that gives you is obviously a, a breakdown of in your of all the questions that come in in a given week, you, you sort of get the buckets, right? How many questions were about billing, how many were about account cancellation, and so on. And that can be very that can be very useful. Um, but there are a couple of, of caveats to that. Um, one is that it can be pretty hard to do, actually, um, to make sure that all tickets do get tagged. And the other question is, do you really need to tag all tickets to get this information? So what some teams do is they tag a sample of tickets. So once a week, someone may take 200, 300 tickets, whatever sample you need to sort of get a representative distribution. And, and they just categorize those. And that'll, assuming you have the right sample, will give you the same breakdown um, without having to be on everyone's back every day of the week to tag to tag all tickets. Um, so whether one or the other approach works for you is, is just is something you need to figure out, but but ask you whether the the approach you're taking right now is the most efficient way to produce the insights that you, you that you need. Another way is to do uh, topic specific tagging. So say um, say the product team is getting ready to work on some of those billing fixes, right, that, that you guys have been talking about for a while. Um, and that's, say, four weeks out. It would probably be very helpful for the product team if the support team for those four weeks just had a temporary tag for, and maybe even a five different tags for billing issues, um, and just tagged every question that came in that's relevant to what the product team is going to be working on and, and just do it for two, three, four weeks, whatever whatever time it takes to get a pile of, of tickets that would be helpful to the product team. And then you stop doing that tagging um, because you're just you're doing it to produce information for a specific decision that the product team needs to make. Um, so let's look at so this is stuff that can be that can be counted. And again, there are there are actually some great articles out there, and uh, we may in, in, I have a link at the end um, for some additional information, and I'll, I'll actually dig up a few articles on how to do tagging well and, and and add it to that page because there are there are some good examples out there and some and some some inspiration. So this was stuff that can be counted. Let's take a quick look at things that can't necessarily be counted, but are very powerful in other ways. And I'll actually just, um, I have a story, <laughs> a short one, from when I worked on uh, advertising products at, at Google. Um, so AdWords, online advertising for small, medium-sized businesses. Um, and we were rebuilding the part of the 
support platform, rewriting all help content, doing making some changes to the product. So we decided to do a round of um, user research, so actual field research, um, and pick some advertisers, go visit them at their place of business, uh, talk to them about what they do day to day, and then have them show us how they how they use the product. Um, so the 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 advertising tool software that we provide to them. And my favorite visit was when um, I wasn't on this visit, but a, three of my colleagues went to visit a a small business, and they you know spent some time in the shop. He showed them the like the storage and sort of products they sell, and talked through the story of the business, and then. They asked if, if you know if they could sit down with him and take a look at how he used the uh, the advertising software that that he he bought from us, and his reply was, um, oh oh okay yeah oh you want to see that well sure, um, if you just like get in your car and follow me then we'll just we'll go over to my uncle's place because I don't I don't own a computer so I use the computer that's in his garage, which was sort of an eye-opening uh, discovery. And the point here isn't that we now needed to go survey how many uh, customers don't have a computer, even though that may be actually be very useful information. But the point was more that we never even considered that that was a dimension of our user experience that, that we should be thinking about. So. Um, so I know when when sitting in the inbox and looking at support tickets or being on the phone with users, you're not there in their store, but but thinking back to that peripheral vision we talked about before, you have the opportunity to unearth some of these things, to find information that um, other teams in your company have no way of getting to, um, and these stories are obviously extremely powerful, right? Because if you can if you can paint this picture of um, the actual reality of your user, that that is very helpful to your product team. And the killer application is when you can combine the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, so if there's one thing your sales team is interested in, can you give them a number on how? on how much a specific feature helps some users plus some testimonials or some descriptions of how how it felt to the user, then you have a, a killer piece of information. So finally, and this is the, the last bit on this one, there's, there's one final aspect of user research that you can apply, and that is create the data you need. And I don't mean to go all creative accounting and just fabricate results and make up whatever you think would be great. No, I mean um, creating data by prompting users. Um, so obviously, you host teams probably do some sort of surveying. Um, um, you may do product interviews with customers. But in the course of, of doing day-to-day -day support, that's also an opportunity to, to, to ask some of these questions. Um, so let's. So one of the examples we talked about before was, say, a marketing team is struggling to meet their acquisition numbers, and they really need to find some new co-marketing partners um, that they could potentially partner with to bring in more businesses, uh, more customers to your company. Um, it would be really helpful for that marketing team if you, for just one week, maybe two weeks, uh, whenever you're talking to and this can be on the phone or by email, talk to customers in the particular segment they're interested in. For example, ask them, um, what other software tools are you using right now? Or what other software tools did you use today? Um, because each of those tools would be a potential co-marketing partner. Um, so you can essentially help the marketing team build their list of potential partners to reach out to. There are many other ways of doing this, but but I would encourage you to just start thinking about what is um, what's data you have the opportunity to create and deliver to your colleagues. That that and this is not something they will be thinking about. So you need to make these connections and and bring this information to them. So think about ways you're uniquely positioned to to get those answers to the other teams. Um, third and final section here. 
um, we've now talked you talk to your colleagues about what they truly need their goals their motivations their reality if you've looked at what information you have available and how you extract it or um, or go create it so to speak and and finally here just a few brief notes on taking that information packaging it up and delivering it to your colleagues and I think this is the most important point and so the point is to be brief but comprehensive right which is by no means simple to do in fact it's it's really hard writing writing shorter is much harder than than just letting letting your fingers run on the keyboard and, and writing um, whatever comes out of your mind but this is where the magic is if you can hit the right delivery of the right pieces of information then you'll have a whole lot of new friends that work and this is a very boring slide it's also a very boring email actually and that's perfectly fine don't worry about the uh, aesthetic um, aspects of what you're trying to do for your colleagues here you're literally just trying to find the smallest piece of information that will be useful to them and email may not be the right way to do it um, setting up new meetings may not be either um, but the point is that that's something you need to figure out right that's where the sort of the context of your team comes in if you're talking to a product team they probably they'll often have a stand-up maybe that's the right um, place to deliver the information so you would just go and tell them in a couple of sentences whatever it is they need to know for your sales team they may have um, one weekly session where they iterate on their pitches and it may just be 30 minutes may be very helpful for them to just have an email with a couple of sentences that they can just copy paste into their pitch and test the next week um, so this is just something you need to consider um, also if you've done all these things well if you truly got to the core of their problems and understand their reality then you're in a really good position to be the expert um, and when you distill your insights down it's okay it's okay actually you need to also add your your opinion right that's the whole point here is that you're not necessarily just giving your your the people you work with um, data you're giving them data that's directly applicable for them but you're also telling them what they should do um, and because you have had this conversation with them, with them it's actually a lot easier to also to push what you're suggesting that they do um, because you can be confident that it will actually help them um, so the steps we've been talking about here just helps put you in a much better position to truly be of value to the rest of the company a couple of quick notes on things uh, not to do um, don't try to help everyone at once you may go ask everyone at your company what their challenge is and your your mind will be fireworks of ideas for what you could do for them don't do it don't help try to help everyone at once don't set up standing meetings okay maybe a standing meeting is the thing to do but more often than not it isn't um, no one needs more meetings so again think about what's the, the most efficient way of delivering the information you come up with to your colleagues and don't judge you know empathy we're trying to understand the situation people are in and then help them um, from from their position from whatever the challenges they're facing um, so this is really what I would challenge you to do um, today or tomorrow it's pretty simple um, pick a team at your company pick a person in that team ask them what their challenge is go back and look at the information you have available find um, one or two things that you think can help those those colleagues make a decision and really help um, help them move towards their goals um, find a good way to get it to them and then do that for four weeks at the end of four weeks you take a look at it see did it actually work out or not 
Um, maybe you want to iterate it, maybe you want to stop wasting everyone's time. But at least this will get you closer to making your support conversations useful to the rest of your company. Um, so with that, um, I'll hand it back to Sarah and any questions that you guys may have. And you're also very welcome to hit me up on Twitter or email me if, if you wake up in the middle of the night with um, something you desperately want to ask me. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Martin. That was really insightful. Um, I love the, the tips about keeping it really simple. So I think often people try and do too much. They want to help everyone with all of the things, and then it gets kind of <laughs> lost and confused. It, it does. That's how you end up spending a day and a half a week pulling data and putting together crazy reports and dashboards. And then it's just noise. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, they can pop them in Twitter or on the side panel. Um, to start off, we've got one here. Um, so who would be the best person to own this kind of initiative? Is it a support manager? Is it a senior person on the team? Or should everyone in support kind of be thinking along these lines? Well, the point is that it isn't so much about owning, it's about doing. And anyone can do this, no matter which level you're at or, or, or what position you're in. Um, you may find you have slightly different access or your the, the, what the impact you'll have will be a little different, um, whether you're a support rep or you're a VP of something. But I wouldn't worry about who should own it. I would just, I would just ask myself, can I go do this? Yeah, that's a good point. It's uh, all about the action. Um, got another one here. Um, so you talked a little bit about tagging tickets, um, and uh, I've always found that hindsight is 2020. You can always go back and look and see, oh yeah, we saw that trend happening. How do you be proactive about that? How do you know what tags you should be using maybe bef before or as they're coming in? Um, what What's the best way to categorize that, those tickets? Yeah, that's that's a very good that's a very good question with uh, with a with a very very long answer. I think uh, I'll try this I'll try the short one. Um, knowing things ahead of time and seeing trends is always will always be a lot of work. Um, if you truly want to set up a system where your tags are granular enough, then you need to spend some time analyzing tickets that have come in plus looking at what are um, what are what, what's the breakdown of your product that you're interested in and then based on that build a taxonomy of tickets and this takes time like we're talking at least a day or a couple of days of work here to actually build a comprehensive tagging system um, then getting everyone to consistently do tagging is 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 also work because it's it's a new process you need to put in place that's that's um, what will get you to the place where you can see trends about everything. I wouldn't do that, though. I wouldn't start out there at all hmm. um, because trends and the thing is, they'll always, I mean, you'll always have, you'll always have missed something in hindsight. So I wouldn't worry about getting it perfect. I would just, if I, if I was doing no tagging, I would start out with the, the topic specific tabbing, tagging. Um, and, and say, okay, as a company, what are we focused on right now? Let's be on the lookout for any tickets related to that and just tag those. So tag things we can act on right now. Over Definitely. time, I would, I would probably build out the system um, and, and you know, try to get the big picture, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that uh, early on. Uh, okay. Uh, good, good point. I think the other thing is that when you said um, asking people what their challenges are, that can, I found product managers sometimes have something in the back of their mind that they want to know about. And so if you know what the next feature is, then you can start looking for those questions and tagging them even before the feature gets released. Yeah. Um, which I like. Absolutely. Got um, one more question. Um, oh, what is the link? that you mentioned earlier about giving tips on how to tag. Um, we, I'll, I'll send that out. That's the support-driven one that you're thinking of, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I'll send that through, Susan. Cool. 
Um, so thank you so much uh, for for your time, for your insight. It was incredibly insightful. Um, and hopefully we can do this again soon. Oh, absolutely. I, I enjoyed it. And, and thank <laughs> cool. you for the questions, everyone. Oh, thank you. All right. We will, uh, everyone have a good day. Uh, this is recorded, so we'll send out a link as well.